Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicle Stories of the Supernatural. How's everybody doing today? Good, I hope. I'm doing super good. And I know I'm going to do my, I'm the weather whip. <laughs> the South Florida weather whip, yes. Even though you guys are not going to see this for a little bit, it's right now, it's the end of February. And we actually have uh, the, the temperatures are going to dip down into the 40s. So you know that weather wimp that I am, we're like uh, brought in all my animals, uh, the birds. You know, I, I can't bring in the chickens, but pretty soon, uh, you know, like, of course, this the temperature in the 40s is equivalent to Antarctica for me. Uh, so, yeah, that's where it's at. The only good thing um, that I found that I was, as a matter of fact, I was uh, commenting to my husband was that luckily this winter, which is usually the dry season for South Florida has been, we've had good rain, which is great for my crops, for my trees. Because I remember last winter, we spent a lot of time going out there, hauling water around and making sure those hundred and something trees got watered because it was such a dry winter. And this year we have been super lucky that I want to say like at least every three to four days, which is perfect for what we're growing out there. We're getting some rain some rain sometimes heavy rain so yeah but then you get to, and as a matter of fact uh what, what we found is that usually the rainfall proceeds the next day is when we get these temperatures that dip down into the 40s and i'm thinking to myself you know because i found out the hard way like i've lived here all my life to us it's like and then you go out to the beach and you see all the tourists from canada and up north and they're like walking around in t-shirts going oh this is great weather and you see them in the water and we're like what what are you doing and they're like, this is great. And we're like, uh-huh. So yeah, <laughs> you can tell. You come down here to South Florida, especially Miami, and you can absolutely tell the tourists from the natives right away just by how we're dressed. But anyway, let's get to the good part. And that is who I have tonight for the guests. And I know you guys are going to be very excited. This is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Craig Little. And he is a psychologist turned explorer and documentary maker. Now, since 2003, Greg and his wife, Laura, have been actively searching the Bahamas for archaeological ruins that might be linked to Atlantis. Uh, he's worked with the Edgar Casey organization in its Search for Atlantis project and uh, also with the archaeologist Bill Donato. The Littles have conducted wide explorations around Bibini, Andros, and the Great Bahama Bank. Now, their exploration has been featured on the National Geographic Channel, the Learning Channel, MSNBC, Sci-Fi Discovery, and the History Channel. He is the co-author of several books, including Edgar Cayce's Atlantis, Mound Builders, Ancient South America, and People of the Web, and has over 30 other books in print in various areas of psychology. And uh, you'll see in some of the slides, uh, for those of you who, who actually see the video versus listening to it on YouTube, that uh, I'll show some of the book covers. And as you know, also, I will always include a link in the credits of the show. And later on, we'll go ahead and we'll give out a website. Uh, I know I'm, absolutely because I, that you can also find uh, Greg's work on Amazon. But let's bring him on. How are you doing today, Greg? I'm great, Marlene, and uh, I'm a bit envious that you're down there in Miami. We have, obviously, since we go to the, ba or have gone to the Bahamas quite a bit, we're in right. and out of the Miami and Fort Lauderdale uh -huh. area fairly often. That's where we leave from and usually take a boat over. Sometimes we yes. fly over. But I'm doing great, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise. Um, Greg, I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests, um, It's in which I commented to you earlier. It looks like you started out in psychology, but, but if you could explain how your interest grew into uh, everything that I described. Uh, did, did it, were you one of these persons that was always interested in it or did something happen, some experience that you had? Uh, man, that's a, that is a tough one to answer because I can look back and see a lot of different things that happened and got my interest. But basically my, my initial interest in, in what, I'll best describe as UFOs, mm -hmm. started in the 1960s when we moved to Huntsville, Alabama, okay. and my father worked for NASA for about three years. And for some reason then, uh, somebody gave me some UFO books, which then were very, very popular. Um, and I just kind of got interested in it, but of course I was pretty much a kid then. 
Right. And as time went on, I needed a career. I really wasn't that much into the paranormal. I was zero into Atlantis, zero into archaeology, no interest that I can tell you at all. I don't really know why I like psychology, but it was the only thing I could stand in college. And okay. So I, yeah, I started taking psychology, and I actually worked all the way through undergraduate school and then all the way through graduate school, and I worked at the newspapers. I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was going mm-hmm. to Me- what was then Memphis State at the time, Memphis State University, which no longer exists because it's now the University of Memphis, and I love to say every time I can, I hate it when they change the name of your college. Oh, yeah. They, hey, I, people all the time say, whatever happened to Memphis State? And I said, well, it still sits where it was, but it just has a different name. Anyway, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, at during that uh, time period in undergraduate school, I started reading books by John Keel. I do not know why. Uh, okay. John Keel was one of the early people in UFOs, strange phenomena, the Mothman. Most of what everybody knows about West Virginia's Mothman episodes right. came from John Keel. And then um, when I got into graduate school, I retained that interest and and slowly... Uh, for just probably loads of reasons, uh, I stumbled upon Edgar Casey, the psychic. Edgar Casey is known as America's greatest psychic. Uh, he's mm-hmm. the father of holistic medicine in America. Uh, the, the American Medical Association, Association called him that. But I started looking at Casey not because of his psychic readings or his mm-hmm. abilities, but it was because of how he got his psychic abilities. I became interested in people's spiritual experiences, uh, and Casey and several other people had very similar experiences. Work is another good example. Around age 13, they have some sort of vision, an angel appears to them, something happens, and their life is transformed forever. And that's what happened to Casey. And I was just interested in it. Okay. I cannot tell you that I had any specific events that occurred, but I had a lot of people asking me questions about UFOs since I had, by then, uh, read so much. We moved up into the into the 70s, right. and I was still working full-time. I started publishing in the early 1970s professionally in peer-reviewed journals in psychology, I later started publishing in criminal justice journals, and, and psychopharmacology was my original area in graduate school. Okay. Uh, and neurology was what I was really into. And these weird experiences I kept coming back to, getting more and more interested in them. Um, beyond that, I cannot tell you that I had any experiences myself that made me jump into it. Now, since I have been into it, uh, I have had some peculiar experiences, some of which we may get to here in a while. Okay. Uh, but there are real specific things that occurred to get us into the a, the the Casey organization search for Atlantis project. We spent 25 weeks searching in the Bahamas. We actually formed an expedition team, a crew, and went into the a very remote area of the Yucatan Peninsula into Guatemala, Mm -hmm. where there are no people uh, to look at a site that Edgar Cayce said may house what he called the Hall of Records, the third Hall of Records. Uh, So we got heavily involved in that. We are still involved in the Cayce organization to the extent that my wife serves as... uh, Right now she's the chairperson of the board of trustees of the Edgar Cayce organization, uh, the Edgar Casey Foundation and Atlantic University is run from there, uh, the Casey organization. So we're pretty deeply entrenched in all that. Uh, as far as getting into Atlantis, that occurred accidentally. I had no interest in it at all. Okay. And it was a British author by the name of Andrew Collins who came to the um, organization's Ancient Mysteries Conference around 2001. And at that time... I had by then I had already written a long series of books, uh, actually four different books on um, UFOs, paranormal experiences, Indian mounds, which are I'm probably best known now professionally for my work in Indian mounds. I have a 
um, it's called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Native American Indian Mounds and Earthworks. It's a massive book, okay. oversized hardcover that has over a thousand sites in it uh, with photos and illustrations and surveys and, uh, and descriptions. So that's what I'm best known as. And so I, I gave presentations at the at the Casey Organization's Ancient Mysteries Conference. Andrew Collins came in to talk about Atlantis, which I had become friends with him, got him to come over to give this talk. And in his talk, he showed two photos from the 1970s that had been taken by a Miami zoologist uh, flying over the Bahamas and a friend of his who was a French uh, marine biologist, both of whom had PhDs. Mm -hmm. They were both based from Miami. And they, they had found these structures in the air, but no one had ever been able to find them. They'd never been able to go back and actually find them and go out to visit them on boats. Really? Andrew showed those pictures right. One of them is a large ring. What in, It was always described as a triple ring of standing stones. So if you think of a ring of standing stones, like mm -hmm. Avebury in England, which is right. enormous, uh, that's what it looked like. It was it was maybe a thousand feet in diameter, which is huge. It had three rows of standing stones, but it was in water, and the stones protruded out of the water. So that really? was one of the things. And, well, it isn't that. Uh, we did get to it. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. The the second thing that no one had ever been able to find was with this uh, Miami Marine. The Miami zoologist name was uh, J. Manson Valentine. He had a friend, this guy from France, who was a Ph.D., named Dmitry Rebikoff. Rebikoff and Valentine found a formation which became known as Rebikoff's E. When I say E, what I'm referring to is the shape of the cursive letter E. Okay. So if you can imagine an E-shaped form on the bottom of the floor of the ocean, maybe in 10 to 20 feet of water, and right. it's very distinct from the air, that was Ribikoff Sea. No one had ever been able to find it on the water. Okay. And as I saw Andrew give this presentation, and I turned to my wife and I said, just a snap decision, we're going to go find those. We're going to go find and see what those things are. Now, at the time, I have sent for many, many years, uh, well, several decades now, four decades, really, uh, we've pretty much had the means to pretty much do whatever we want to do. I do write a lot. I still work. My profession mm -hmm. is a criminal psychologist. Uh, but basically, I only write material, uh, treatment material for criminal psychology or textbooks or other things like that. Okay. So we had the ability to go wherever we wanted to go, and we literally uh, put together a trip with just my wife and I. Uh, we looked up the pilot who was flying the plane uh, when they took this picture from a plane of this triple ring of standing stones. We found that pilot in Miami, Florida. Really? He was older. Uh, I got a hold of him, and we visited him the day before we left, and we filmed that. It's on a. It's been shown on documentaries a number of times. But he said, and this is on film. His exact phrase was, "Well, strangely, people have been very uncurious about it because I asked him who has asked you where this thing was, mm -hmm. but so many people had tried to find it. One expedition." spent $30,000 flying planes around and around an area, it's really an area called Andros Island. Right. Uh, but they were unable to find it. Now, Andros is the largest of the Bahama Islands. It uh, is about a, about 50 to 100 miles beyond Bimini, which is only 55 miles due east of Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Andros is about 104 miles long. So it's the largest of all the Bahama Islands, but it's also almost completely uninhabited, totally uninhabited on the west side. So the guy said, nobody's ever asked me. And I said, well, do you remember where it was? And he said, sure. And I, I said, Can he's you like, tell oh, us? finally somebody's asking me. <laughs> yes. And he, all right, so he's a pilot. And I'm a, I have a pilot's license too. At the time I was flying. And so I said, well, can you show us where it was? And he said, yeah, I'll be right back. He came out with a pilot's map, an aerial map, and laid it down and pointed and said it was right there. 
<laughs> how long? How long had it been since he had cited it to when you actually it was asked him? 1968. Wow. 1968. Charles Berlitz, a very famous writer. Uh, Berlitz wrote a whole bunch of books on UFOs and on the Bermuda Triangle and on Atlantis, very the bestsellers. That picture is in every one of those books that Berlitz wrote because it's so impressive from the air. It looks mm-hmm. really impressive. So, so I, I then decided we needed to charter a plane. I needed a two-engine high-wing plane. A high-wing plane is sort of like a Cessna. The wings are above you, and you can look down, and the mm-hmm. wings don't block your view. But I needed one that would go slow. We found an, it's called a Norman Islander. Uh, we took it out of Fort Lauderdale, and actually we took it out of the same airport that Flight 19 left from. Oh. Uh, it is a, it is a private airport there, and it's got a really nice plaque about Flight 19 there. The pilot, that the people that I chartered from, when I laid out a pilot's map to show him where I wanted to go, I said, you know, it's I'm I'm trying to find somebody who's willing to fly down here because it's an extreme southern Andros uh, in the water, but that is in Cuban airspace. And back up until the 1970s, the mid-1970s, Cuba had actually still been shooting down private aircraft that yes. wandered into their airspace. Yeah, people so don't realize that there was a time that they were doing that. Yes. Oh, up until the night, it was like 1977, I believe, mm-hmm. was the last time. So, and I said, this is in Cuban airspace. And he said, man, this looks like a great little adventure. He said, I don't care. <laughs> he said, we'll just fly, we'll fly at 100 feet. He said, we'll go below radar. So we did. We went up and down. We found Ribikoff's E on the north side. And the beauty of finding it like this, when the initial people found it, they didn't have GPS. Okay. Today, we have GPS. So we immediately took we took the GPS the moment we float flew over these spots. Uh, then we uh, landed. I had prearranged this place uh, on Eastern Andros, the, the only places you can really stay. There's only a few on Andros, and we eventually found a sponge diver. That's what they're called there. They actually just dive into the water and pull up sponge. We found mm-hmm. a sponge diver who was willing to get us there. No one else would take us. It sounds like an easy thing, but here's the truth about Western Andros. It's like a 60-mile trip through the island, through what are called bites, to get there. You can walk five miles into the water there at low tide, and the water's never over your head. Right. Five miles, so big boats can't get in. Right. Cell phones don't work there. Satellite phones don't work, which they, National Geographic found with this. They said, oh, they've got to work. I said, no, they don't work because they're blocked down there. There are no planes that fly overhead because there's no flight routes that are there, and you see no other boats ever. Well, why, why, why is, for example, the satellite phones blocked? Ah, the U.S. Oh. <laughs> the British Navy have them blocked. While we were there filming with uh, the Discovery Channel years ago, we were on the eastern side of Andros, and my wife and I, they had us sitting on something uh, on the big rock on the shore, and they were shooting out to the ocean, and a st- straight up, like the, like you see in the movies, right. went up into the air and then crashed on the water and immediately sank again. So there are, the only thing on the eastern side, the only reason it's really occupied there are seven U.S. Navy and British Navy bases that are submarine. They call them, uh, it's, it's called AUTEC, A-U-T-E-C, the Atlantic Testing and Underwater Evaluation um, Center, and they're actually Navy bases. Uh, I've been in one of them by accident, uh, and that was with um, the History Channel. You can see bits of that on a show called Mystery Quest. Yes, I know uh, which one that is. Yeah, uh, we were on set several of the very first episodes of Mystery Quest with this. Uh, and there was a, in this Navy base, there was a high-speed um, stealth destroyer in there. And we were met with machine guns. There was one other person on the boat with me. It was night. Uh, oh. and and very stern faces and threats and told to get out. I can't repeat what they said. 
because they cursed a lot and yelled. But, I mean, they were very angry at us. Uh, but anyway, back to the story. So we, we eventually got over to that other side. And the first thing that we went to was this circle. And you could see it as we approached it. They look like standing stones sticking out of the water. It was still there. Uh, we measured it and all that, and we had to literally walk right up to them to see what they were. And this is very strange. They were giant sponge. What? They were sponge. I know. What? It's like, what are you saying here? Yes, they were sponge. And actually, the sponge diver was just elated because he said they were worth a fortune. Real sponge, I mean, that's what they do. They collect these things. He'd never uh-huh. seen any that big. Uh, it, the, it was a perfect white circle in the center of them. It wasn't a full triple ring. It simply was an illusion that you would see from the air. When we flew, okay. flew over it, it looked like it. Uh, but they were sponge. And the sponge then uh, I found in a marine biology book while we were still staying in this place in on Andros, uh, it's a natural formation, very rare, but it does occur naturally, and it has to do with fish movements, crustaceans in the center, and a small coral reef, and then fish going around, uh, circling around it, and larger fish circling around it, and larger fish. The crustaceans in the center start pushing sand out to clean out places for them to live. That's like crabs and uh-huh. shrimp and so on, and lo- loads of lobsters down there. So they push the sand out, then the fish swimming around push it out into perfect circles, and then the bigger fish make the circles bigger and bigger. Eventually, there's some rock or something that gets exposed on the bottom. The bottom has to be exposed for the sponge to grow, and then the sponge grabs a hold, and the reason that it wasn't bigger was because the fish kept uh, putting sand over different areas. So that was it. It was fascinating. I wonder how many years it took for it to do that, for it actually uh, to be seen. You know, that's a really good question. But it must have been quite a long time, I imagine. It pro- well, the guy said no one that he knew, the sponge diver that we used, and he's on our films also, he said he had never known anybody that would go down there. It's a very dangerous trip. There is nobody to help you. Uh, and it's so shallow, you have to use... Uh, you have to use a small boat. You right. have to use outboard motors. And he had to stop repeatedly because his motor kept sucking sand into the engine. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so it stopped repeatedly. But he knew what he was doing. And that actually helped me because later we got our own boat to do this, uh, a bigger one with a, uh, a very sh- sl- a small draft of only a foot. Mm-hmm. And we had the same problem. Uh, sand would get sucked into our engine, yeah. but I yeah. learned how to fix it from him. So I mean, then, I, I've gone out in the boat. It's even in the keys and all these shallow places. You have to be really, really careful. Oh yeah, because if not, you'll get stuck. And but let me ask you: Was nobody going out there because how shallow it was, or because it was? Well, just... they couldn't. They couldn't find it. The other thing is the incredible expense involved. They they didn't know where it was. So you'd have to you'd ha- at that time you'd have to fly back and forth to find it. Okay. And there's not a lot of people willing to shell down thousands of dollars to get a very special type of plane okay. uh, and a pilot willing to fly into Cuban airspace. That's what I was about to say. It sounds like everybody, it was that, that would be, I imagine, the first problem. Well, absolutely. Be... And it's just the logistics. There's yeah. nobody there. We could not hire anybody that uh, was willing to get us over there. Yeah. Uh, and people, no one that I know of that can ha- that had a boat that could go the distance, like from Bimini to South Andros, is about 190 miles. Okay. Uh, and you'd need a fairly large boat to do that to carry enough gas, but you can't get in the shore. Right. Uh, you couldn't get close enough, and you'd have to find the formation to begin with. So we we then uh, a week later we went to find this Ribikoff's E which we did, uh, and it was, um, it turned out to be a natural coral head, a very large one, that just had turtle grass growing in it that looked, that had grown into what looked like the letter E. And again, that was seen in 1968 also, and it is still there. And so I figured we've done what we were going to do. We are through. That's it. That night, there was a violent thunderstorm that occurred. We were staying in North Andros then, and we had a knock at the door, and a guy came in, 
and he thought we were treasure hunters. He said, everybody's talking about you guys here. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, everybody thinks you're treasure hunting. And I pulled out the pictures. I pulled out everything I had. I said, we are not treasure hunting. Here is what we're looking for. We're making a film on all this. And he said, okay, I believe you. He said, I just wanted to make sure that you were legit. He said, because everybody else is looking for Spanish galleons. And we said, nope. And he said, well, let me tell you something. There is this formation out here that looks a lot like the Bimini Road. It's covered now and then with sand and uncovered other times. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he told me how to do it, how to go to it. It was no more than 300 yards from where we were staying at that moment. Now, we had a charter coming over to pick us up the next morning. But early the next morning, my wife and I walked to this place. I snorkeled out into the ocean, which now seems unbelievably foolish and stupid to me. But I went, <laughs> I went way out, uh, found this strange formation of these massive square and rectangular blocks, some of which were sitting on top of each other, went up and down it, except I couldn't find the ends. I saw it had like layer after layer took a few photos and came back. Uh, at the time, we were using film. Digital cameras really weren't around. Right. Yes. Uh, we were using film, so we had to get it developed. We went back home because we already had to, the charter was actually on its way uh, to pick us up. And then we decided we've got to go back and look at this. So we did. And as we discovered more and more portions of this thing and took loads of film and photographs, uh, we issued articles about it. It got a huge amount of attention. Uh, we wound up going back there. Even UFO hunters did an episode where we mm-hmm. went there. Uh, the one called the Underwater Area 51 has it. They took um, a, a lot of film of it. Okay. Um, and it's a. it looks like the Bimini Road. Uh, the Bimini Road, of course, is at Bimini. It is a formation of stone. It's a J-shaped formation. It's about 1,600 feet long. Okay. Uh, and it's probably a harbor. It's a breakwater, uh, or what would be called a key, spelled Q-U-A-Y. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it would form a harbor. It's a breakwater for ships. Okay. Uh, they, they both are the same depth. The one at uh, Andros looks the same. We took a trip uh, on another documentary uh, to Quesal, which is really close to Cuba. There is another one of these underwater formations there at Quesal. So what we basically believe we found was an unrecognized maritime culture that dates to approximately three to 5,000 B.C. Wow. So this... Atlantis dates to 10,000 B.C. That's when it was destroyed. So this would be a post-Atlantis thing. But, of course, that led us on to a lot more... Uh, there have been loads of things now found in the Bahamas that are at the 10,000 B.C. shoreline. Uh, Bill Donato, the archaeologist you mentioned at the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, did side scan sonar, as did we, uh, along the 10,000 B.C. shoreline at, and- at uh, Bimini, which is uh, basically 100 to 115 feet deep. Okay. And there is a row, three rows of what look like square and rectangular buildings that are right on the 10,000 B.C. shoreline. They run for about a mile and a quarter, north and south. They face toward uh, Florida, actually, on that side of of Bimini. Uh, And they're very uniform. We have, um, I could say, three rows of them. I actually counted them on the side scan sonar, uh, but we didn't have an image of the empty to 70 of these building-like formations. We have dove them, although they're they're very deep. We had a uh, highly professional underwater oceanographer with us uh, who had never seen anything like it, but they're covered in coral. They have building blocks on the sides, which we believe they're all building foundations, and that is good evidence of something that was there in 10,000 B.C., the last I, thing we found, go ahead, sorry. Has, let me ask you, now with the use of satellites, have you found anything? Because I know that, that sometimes some things, like you said, you know, yeah. you can only see it from a certain distance yep. above. Well, you can see, uh, you can see this circle now on Southern Andros. Oh. Uh, on Google Earth, you can see the, there's actually two circles there. I just, I figured I wouldn't take the time to explain all of it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but there's two circles down there, and you can see the one that was the triple ring of stones. Uh, the got the sponge diver we took told us he was going to go back because we okay. found a huge sponge field there. But he could, he would have filled his boat up with far more than he'd ever need from the field before we even got to this thing. But okay. it's still there, and it's very visible on Google Earth. It's all the way on Southern Andros, uh, and it is east of Southern Andros, very visible on Google Earth, like I said. But you can't see the Bimini Road on Google Earth, and it's only 20 to 25 feet deep. Okay. Uh, you can't see the 100-foot formations on Google Earth. And there is another thing, one of the last things. I'm, I'm skipping through loads of other things we found, including 31 underwater planes. Mm -hmm. That's another whole story. Wow. Um, including some of the Bermuda Triangle planes. Uh, we found several of those, and one of those we found with National Geographic. But there is a about 30 miles south of, Andra, of Bimini. Sorry, <laughs> too many places there. Uh -huh. About 30 miles due south of Bimini. Off of a small chain of islands, there is what appears to be a collapsed temple. The, it is made out of schist, spelled S-C-H-I-S-T. It is a type of stone. Okay. It is the exact same kind of stone that the Oracle of Delphi was built out of. Really? There are fluted columns that are there. It's all very old. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see beams and polished beams, very flat, uh, like flooring, the huge slabs, like maybe 10 feet by 8 feet, only maybe 8 to 10 inches thick, but they're like slabs. And then there's these giant beams. They're monstrously big. We've had it tested by several geology labs and universities, including some in Florida, uh, and they've identified the probable sources of it. Uh, a ship hit it. We found that a ship hit this formation in 18, uh, well, I can't, the exact year, but I'm going to be wrong on it, but roughly okay. 1829, a ship hit it. When the ship hit it, the ship burned, and uh, that is the first time this thing was seen, although it wasn't reported, because the people okay. that talked about seeing it salvaged what was left on the ship. Okay. Uh, but it is in a very strange area. Uh, we, when we found it, we reported it to the Bahamian authorities, and they have since uh, declared it an archaeological site and off limits. Uh, it has oh. been it a salvage claim. This is going to sound even more bizarre. We had contacts with a representative of the Microsoft Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Microsoft supports a lot of. Uh, archaeological work. Most people aren't aware of that, but their foundation supports archaeology. And initially, when we were contacted, they somebody there was interested in uh, perhaps rebuilding this thing in place, which we told them they could not do it in place. And it appear, it looks like to us the building was stood standing up on what was a high point. Ten, okay. 10,000 years ago, the ocean levels were roughly so this this place where it is it would have been sitting on a very high point that would have fallen off dramatically it would have been on a, almost a a mountain peak that would look like that from the water and what it looks like to us is that mm -hmm. a wave hit it and knocked it in one direction that's what it right. appears right i see to what be. you're saying Yes. It didn't collapse so, in on itself. It was like... Yeah, yeah, it collapsed. Right. So Microsoft sent this guy down. He wound up looking at it. Uh, he agreed with us that they could not, probably couldn't rebuild it in sight, but they had an interest in maybe salvaging it at all and rebuilding it on land. So they wound up filing a salvage claim on it. This was about three years ago that, that transpired. Okay. So we were ordered by the Bahamians. They... They had a problem a few years ago with people that did find Spanish galleons mm -hmm. there and take gold without reporting it correctly. So okay. they put a moratorium out on all permits, archaeological permits, ge geology permits, and salvage permits. So we didn't go then for quite a while. We didn't go back. Uh, they've told us we can go back under a film permit, but we can't go to this site again under 
an archaeology permit because there's already a salvage permit on them or a salvage claim. Because all of so these anyway, are in Bahamian is, waters. That's the thing. It's not even international. Yes. They're all Bahamian waters. So yes, it's all Bahamian waters. Yeah, yeah people don't realize. And it's not finders keepers. That's, yeah. That's, yeah, too many people believe that if you find something, it's yours. And it just isn't that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we found, like I said, we found 31 planes. Um, there are several that I've found on Google Earth since uh, it got Google Earth got better that we want to go look at, including some on land. Uh, we know we found two that were definitely um, on the Bermuda Triangle list of, of you know, official planes lost. Right. Um, I don't believe that there's much paranormal explanation for it. I just know as a pilot myself and being out on boats and having very bizarre things happen, weird stuff happens, people can be, make stupid decisions, okay. pilots can uh, overestimate their own ability, uh, even when you have weather radar and all that kind of stuff, you can overestimate your ability and make a bad decision. But we, like I said, did have a lot of weird things happen. Uh, and we've had strange things happen at Indian mounds that we've gone to. That's, Like I said, that's my real area. When you say strange, like personally or with equipment, well, electronics? Well, we did have things happen with equipment that also... Uh, uh, the last time, let's see, was it the, no, uh, the next to last trip that we took, we got a large, what I'd call, we called it our home ship, uh, but it was a liveaboard. So we chartered this large ship, and then we took ours. Ours is a specially built catamaran that's very fast, that only has a one-foot draft. But uh, it can go a long distance. We have lots of safety equipment on it, and we have side scan, scan sonar installed on it. So we pulled that on the back of this boat along with a second boat. So we love backups to our back, backups. Mm -hmm. So we, we found this plane that we needed to pull things out of. We wanted to explore it. And it took us uh, the mothership that we lived on went seven knots, which is about well, roughly nine miles an hour okay. uh, is what it did. And we went 160 miles at nine miles an hour. And so we were, we, it took us till late at night to get where we were going. Okay. I was sitting on the back of this boat, and we were surrounded with thunderstorms all around us. And my wife was sitting in a different area, and I said, come back here and sit, and just sit with me a bit. So she came back and sit, sat with me. And she said, what is that? I said, well, that's what I wanted to know. I said, tell me if you see anything else. And he said, yeah. And I said, what are you seeing? And she said, I'm seeing these balls of light. I'm seeing these red, sometimes green, sometimes blue, and white balls of light forming. Oh. And they were forming maybe, it's hard to estimate, but I'd say 100 to 200 yards away in the sky around us. A ball of light would form. It would last three, four seconds, and then it would just fade away or sometimes just pop off. Sometimes it popped on. Sometimes they popped off. Sometimes they just faded in and faded out, but they were all around us. Uh, and we watched that for about two hours occurring. <laughs> Can you imagine? We've, we have seen the glows in the water, which they claim that's a type of... Um, uh, it's a type of plankton they claim. I can't say that I'm, I'm, I, I buy all that. But that night, we finally got to this plane that we had found before, but we were unable to get in it and explore it. So this plane's okay. in about 30 feet of water. Okay. Uh, and so we set up our filming equipment, and we have a remote camera, a video camera that the divers will take down in, and it was the first time that I actually didn't do the scuba diving down in it. My wife did with two Bahamians while I was on the boat with two other people. Okay. While we were up there, and I'm watching the film as they go down, they get into the cockpit of the plane. They go in through the front, mm -hmm. and there's a shark down in the cockpit, and it takes off then through okay. the back of the plane. And then I look around us, and again, there's this massive storm coming in, but this one's coming right at us. And I've okay. got a really good video camera, and I see five water spouts all at once. Oh. Unreal looking. I got them on film. And this storm passed over us. It was so violent, it was unreal. And then the divers start coming up with things. And I said, what would you guys think of the storm? And they said, what storm? They had no idea. 
that there had been a storm. None. It just what, zoomed right across us. Well, they brought up stuff from that the pilot had left in. They brought up the pilot's pants. Uh, there and was what, money. What, how in, big? How big was this plane? Uh, it was a two-engine Apache, uh, and it was um, uh, six seats, six-seater, two engines. Okay. Um, and it had a pretty large cargo area in the back, but in the pilot's pants was his passport. Really? So obviously we could find out who it was. Yeah, passports, I will tell you. It had been, this plane had been in the water over 30 years because we found the whole story. And But passports wow. do well in salt water. <laughs> Coins, not so well. Another story. But baby diapers, they brought up stacks of beautiful, pristine white baby diapers that hadn't, had, that they had bought uh, when they were going back and forth. They actually were going from Puerto Rico back to Miami uh-huh. uh, in this plane when it crashed, and they were carrying uh, baby diapers with them and other stuff. But it tells you about baby diapers. You put them in a dump, and they are not going to degrade very yeah, easily. Gonna, that, that biodegradable is much. Right. So let me, at, were the passengers, I imagine, was everybody okay? That they Well, were... they act, it's, it's, it was a miracle. It was written up in several newspapers because it's in the area where there's almost no airplane flights over it. There's no boats that go out there. You never wow. see another boat or ship. You never, and cell phones again, well, they didn't exist then. Right. And but they still had the satellite phones shut off, and I don't even think sat sat phones were available when this plane crashed anyway. Uh, so it was a miracle. It's a long involved story, but uh, they shouted May Day as it was going down. Um, a plane that was flying at thirty thousand feet near Miami what? barely picked up their May Day. And the the pilot knew what was going on then in the in the commercial aircraft and uh-huh. told him how to how to ditch the plane in the water. There were four people in it. <laughs> That's a strange then, story, because two of the girls were uh, waitresses at Hooters. And <laughs> they were going back and forth from port from um, it was Jamaica, not Puerto Rico. Back and forth from Jamaica uh-huh. to Miami. Uh, and they stay. They had one little inflatable, and they rotated who was on it. But the Coast Guard looked for them for three days and found them on the third day. So, and it's a miracle that they survived, but they did. Anyway, when when this when when they brought that stuff up, uh-huh. and I asked them about the storm, we all thought that people had died on this plane. So we said a little prayer, okay. and then all of a sudden, the outboard motor, which was not running obviously and was in its up position on the the small one that we pulled that wasn't ours it went down into the water you could hear it you know the motor makes uh-huh. a sound it goes like that right it went down and we're all looking at it, and what the heck is that so the guy the bahamian with us who was the captain that owned it ran back and you know put it back up he got back on our boat we're filming everything that was pulled out piece by piece to see what it was and when we got back, it went right back down into the water. Very strange. So he went in. He had to un- undo the battery. He disconnected the battery to get it to stop. So then we realized, well, the lights on the boat aren't working. None of the lights on this boat are working. And then we turned it on. None of the electronics worked. The generator was no longer working. And this was this wow. was a it was a huge fishing boat. The air conditioning didn't work. Nothing that was electrical worked. It had that electrical storm had simply zapped oh. everything. Uh, that that trip then, we had numerous strange experiences after it. Uh, we're actually lucky to be alive. Uh, we gave them a handheld GPS to use then. Uh, which was a problem because the guy that was running the boat really didn't know how to use the GPS. A lot of the Bahamian fishermen um, always keep land in sight. Right, uh, right, got, right. They they steer by landmarks then. Yes, they're not they're not out there using. Well, mm-hmm. they talk about compasses. They don't trust compasses out there really? because the compasses do do weird things, and that is true. Ah. Magnetic compasses do very strange things out there. So you really can't completely trust your magnetic compass on a boat, uh, and a lot of them don't have uh, better electronics on their boat. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's kind of, that's really a I mean, summary that, of. That, 
that's that's unusual that that and, storm comes in and everything goes haywire. Uh, well, the next day we had all right. I'll I'll go ahead and tell you this. It's the only time we ever had film that didn't come out, which it's a strange story. So how we were doing this, we went to extreme southern Andros first, as far down as we could go. And then we would give the captain of the big boat instructions to go north then, and then we were going to explore along land and on land and in the shallow water where he couldn't get. So he was supposed to go like 10, 15, 20 miles north and then anchor and wait for us. So we would drove around the whole day, on our boat, and then we went to the the meeting place, the pre-designated meeting place where he was supposed to be, and he should have been there hours before us, but he wasn't there. And we were at that time in 30 feet of water. We could not see land. We dropped anchor. And when we dropped anchor, we sat there, and I looked at the fuel, uh, and... We got on the radio. We have uh, two radios because we had given them one of ours. We had two radios left on our boat, and we had one with a big antenna we could stick up. And so we called and heard nothing. We called on a channel. Can anybody hear us? No, nobody can hear us at all, which is not unusual. So we used our other radio, same thing, couldn't pick up anybody or anything. And we sat there for about an hour, and it was beginning to get dark. And so I uh, turned to my wife and I said, we need to film this, because she was a little afraid. Uh, And I turned to her and I said, okay, pull this out. And I sat there and I thought, man, this is going to be great for a documentary. And I said, all right, this is how people disappear in the Bermuda Triangle. I said, we are supposed to be able to be picked up here and I had her then pan the camera around. And here's the strange thing, where we were out there. You couldn't see any horizon at all. How unusual. Now, that sounds bizarre. You couldn't tell what was water and what was the air. Really? It, the water was like glass, like a mirror. We have only ever seen that one other time, and all the times we're there, and that was in the estuaries in the middle of Andros Island when it was at high tide and we were going through it but we'd never seen that before. We couldn't see land where we were, and you couldn't see the horizon. The the water was glass reflecting the sky, and it was the most bizarre thing I have ever seen. In fact, you couldn't even tell the water was water until you put your hand down in it, and then you'd see the little ripples coming off your hand. And so I pointed all that out, and I explained what, what had happened, and I said, we are going to, I had a plan then, that this was my way to tell him my plan. We have enough fuel, we can run about 20 miles out into the Gulf Stream. Uh, the Gulf Stream moves north, we can float for seven hours, and we will be close enough then to the, uh, the end of, well, the very first island, and not Bimini, but about 30 miles south of Bimini, there are more islands, and one of them has Brina. I said, we'll get there. And we can refuel. And so I got on the radio while we were doing it and said, if you can hear me, here's what our plan is. Here's what our plan is. So she turned the camera off, and um, I tried both radios again, and the big one picked up nothing. And then the little one, suddenly I started hearing a click, just a click. And then the Bahamian that was with us said, look out there. And we looked out. My eyes are not as good as his. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, it's a, it's a guy. Looks like he's standing on the water. A guy? I was about yeah, to say. Yeah, looked like a guy standing on the water. Now, this is a true story. This is bizarre. <laughs> Remember, the earth has a curvature. Right. So he, this, this Bahamian had fantastic eyes, and he said, I can see a man on the water. And he's getting up into the air now. And slowly but surely, you'd see this form of a guy, and then you could tell, oh, he's on a pole. And then you could see the ship below him as they, you know, as he came over the curvature of the earth, uh-huh. and he was waving like crazy to us. Just <laughs> okay, to... bro. I was like, yeah, he had what? climbed up. 
they had a they had a mast. This wasn't a sailboat, uh-huh. but they had a mast at the very top that had a beacon on it and was supposedly where the radio uh, antenna was. Okay. Uh, and he was up there hanging on, waving like crazy because I told him we're going to go out into the Gulf Stream and float uh-huh. north. Uh, and there, that little radio they had, for some reason. It worked when we left, uh, left it with them that morning, but they could only hear us, and nothing they said had, would come through. So anyway, great story, but when we got back, I decided this is great for the documentary we're making on this. Uh-huh. And then, of course, I was uploading that film, and it was nothing. Absolutely nothing, what? and it was some, what I thought. This is the best little thing that we would that we would have, and it's the only one where we got nothing. And my wife only got one photo of this phenomenon of the glass-like or mirror-like surface of the ocean reflecting the sky. Uh, so that is just one. There's several other strange things we had happened. something, that is so unusual. And people don't realize, you know, unless you're, to, to have the ocean that calm. Yeah. It, it, you're right. It doesn't happen, according to them, the, the people that live there and out on it every day. It's maybe one or two days a year mm-hmm. at the most, and then yes. it's only for an hour or two at a time. Now, remember, we're not out in the, we weren't out in the Gulf Stream where the Gulf Stream's always moving. Yeah, but still. We're maybe 30 miles, I know, we're maybe 30 miles off of Andros, and it's another 30 miles out into the Gulf Stream then. Uh, and we've had some we had some very dangerous times in the Gulf Stream, uh, foolish things. Uh, we did some other foolish things. Um, <laughs> one of our in, in that trip to Guatemala, we stayed on the banks of the Asumacinta River. We had to stay there because it was too dangerous to stay in the jungle. We had pup tents basically that we stayed in with this crew of uh, nine people that we hired to take us in, and. As we were there, there are huge rocks. Uh, we're in the sand, but there's huge rocks around us. And in those rocks are freshwater crocodiles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That would have been the, uh, the end yes. Of the, the uh, other other stupid things we've done. But anyway, let me ask um, you: When you went to the Yucatan Peninsula, what, what's there? I imagine predates like the Maya civilization, right? Yeah. We're, we're talking something. M- much or older than that, right? Yes, we're talking much older than that. Uh, the Maya are the was probably the highest of the civilizations, but even the Olmec are older than the Maya. But there was something there before the Maya, and it, it's now almost universally accepted among archaeologists that the Yucatan Peninsula was almost solid buildings, towns, cities, roads. Mm-hmm. Uh, my latest book. Uh, is with this British author, Andrew Collins. Uh, and it the title is confusing. It's called Denisovan Origins. But in it, I write a section about South America. I've mm-hmm. been just fascinated with about South America since we did a book back in 2001 on Edgar Casey's statements about South America. Uh, and Casey said South America was a lot older than anybody knew uh, in terms of human okay. occupation. And now... It looks like South America was occupied as long ago as 300,000 years. Now, they were not modern humans like us, uh, but they were a type of extinct human, uh, human, well, they're on a human branch, but they're not modern humans, called the Denisovans. Mm -hmm. Uh, But South America was definitely occupied then, uh, it appears another wave of people came in around 100,000 years ago. That's the first that they came into North America. Right. And then loads of people were in South America by 50,000 years ago. And they all came from the South Pacific, which is not, you know, from Siberian Asia. Right, like that, which the, is what you usually think of as far absolutely. as well, how, the people, uh, how yeah, North and people South America did. became populated, yes. Absolutely. They are distinctly, it's a distinctly different genetic population in right. South America than in North America. Right, I've heard it, that they've done that with genetic testing. Yes. That they have found that the origins, like you said, are from the South Pacific. Um, yes. And it's there very a, surprising. Yeah, well, it is surprising, but it fits. There is a, um, 
a scenario that fits that perfectly about what really happened. And what we have been told about the ancient world simply uh, is not is not really the case. Uh, what's been written in history books or archaeology books, it's changing so fast. It's almost like the old fire sign theater album that that was entitled everything you know is wrong Mm -hmm. it's like everything we've been told is just wrong but but anyway let let me get back to all the supernatural stuff so i have been fascinated since the 1980s and this has really been my passion it's indian mounds and it is the rituals involved in them and what they were doing to build pyramids and mounds and earthworks that were of various geometrical shapes, uh, the path of souls journey of the dead souls going back to the stars, Orion fits into this, then the Milky Way fits in, and then the Cygnus constellation, uh, their ideas about what life and death are all about and why we are here. Okay. Uh, that is what I am most interested in. Uh, and like, I guess like, most authors who write really book after book after book, and I'm on my, I'm on my 69th book right now. Oh my God! Uh, I'm trying to reach my age. <laughs> <laughs> that's inc- that's a lot of writing. God, that, that is a lot awful. of writing. Like I said, that's what I've been doing for a long, long time. Um, but I tend to uh, move on. I, I keep incorporating everything I've done before into what I'm doing now, but I really look into new stuff. Uh, I try to in, uh, incorporate whatever is new into the ongoing project that I have. Um, Native Americans, ancient, I don't mean necessarily modern ones. I'm talking mm-hmm. about the mound builder ideas and so on. Right. They had a very good theory, belief system, spirituality, call it whatever you want, about why we are here on this earth. And their idea is is that we are here to balance spiritual forces. And, the, and there are two primary forces that split in, at the beginning when the Big Bang occurred. They actually have a, um, a story about the Big Bang, and it was created by a singularity that developed almost into a yin and a yang, two Mm -hmm. competing forces, um, and the two forces are creation versus entropy. Uh, Entropy is the constant breakdown of everything, and out of things breaking down, you have new creation. And that the physical world was manifested to allow those two forces to manifest, and we humans are here Mm -hmm. to mediate in it, and to maintain a balance. And in the process of that, there are intrusions from these spiritual worlds into our physical world. And that is what we will call, we call paranormal things. Uh, We, our souls do exist. I mean, and this is actually not, it's not just the Native American stuff. I'm finding parallels in everything. Uh, Casey talked about it. Almost every ancient spiritualist talked about it. Most uh, religious religious concepts or theories will talk about the same thing. Uh, but I do believe that there's an explanation that relates to physics that goes into all those things. Uh, and all these things, even the trips to the Bahamas, it all fits the same thing. Ultimately, everything like this Everything we do, it's a spiritual quest. Uh, And I think that's the way people need to look at things. Right. I think. Looking back now, like you said, that you've, you know, you've lived, do you think that in some instances you were led along? Even though ultimately it's your choice, whether you do or you go somewhere, do you think? I believe believe in a true path. I think we all have what's called a true path. Uh, and it's very easy for us to get derailed from it. But when you're on your true path, you do get led along because the signs are already there. Yes. The signposts are along your true path. You just have to notice them and respond to them. As you move down that path, I mean, you can meet somebody that is, um, say, um, not threatening you, but someone seducing you along the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the seduction of a job or money or sex or whatever or a relationship. Right. Uh, and those things can, uh, but we can get off our true path by following those. But you know, you know, you're on your true path 
when all the signs are there and they right. keep appearing as you move down it. Yes. Uh, and that's another whole area I write about in psychology. But, um, yes, so in a way we are being led, mm-hmm. um, and w- whether or not it's some outside of us extraneous sort of spiritual power or energy that is producing those signs, that I don't know. All I know is if you're on your true path, those signs will appear to you. Carl Jung called them synchronicities, meaningful coincidences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you notice those things along the way, then you probably are on your true path. Yeah, yeah. Well, do they say you're at the right place at the right time? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and I think everybody's people, had that experience for some. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that instant where you go, if if I wasn't here at this particular moment. Exactly. Yeah. I think people also know when they're being diverted off of it, mm-hmm. and it's almost always something that makes us feel good in the moment. Oh, sure. Uh, and it may be, it could be uh, a wad of money, uh, or, I mean, if it, finding uh, a satchel full of money, you know, that's a standard moral question that's often right. asked. If you find a satchel of money, what do you do with it? But that's the kind of thing that can be, be a moral test that can get you off of your true path. Uh, or having somebody try to seduce you uh, off of your path, either through sex or job or money or whatever, you know, just because they're really seductive. Uh, And often when we know the difference between right and wrong and we do what we know to be wrong, then you are getting off of that path. Uh, At least that's the way I look at it. And as a criminal psychologist, of course, I look at right and wrong a lot. Sure, sure. And people don't realize that, you know, our subconscious also plays a part in it oh yeah uh oh yeah versus what we think we want or we're gonna do or our what is it the best intentions that kind of thing yeah uh it's like yeah we kind of fool ourselves along those lines as far as uh what what we would like to do or what we plan to do and and sometimes like even like when you were saying originally when you said well i started i started studying psychology because it's the only thing i could stand yeah there you go yeah looking back do you think it was a wise decision, even though well, back then? Well, it, it has allowed me. I can't think of any other career that would pay. Uh, yes, it was a very wise decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can look, but I'll say, I'll say it this way. Monetarily, it was as wise as anything. And it doesn't, that sounds crazy. Right. But uh, the materials that I have written, authored, or co-authored with a variety of people, um, we have treated, I have a treatment system, uh, it's a trademark treatment system called MRT, and it's had over 3 million people go through it. Okay. Uh, we have loads of evidence on it. There's over 200 published studies. Um, it's officially an evidence-based program, and we have loads of uh, treatment workbooks and materials in it. Okay. Uh, and we know it's helped loads of people. Um and it's in 14,000 locations and in eight countries. So, really? yes, I would follow the same path. Yes, that's all absolutely right. true. Sounds bizarre, but, yeah, we're in 14,000 locations. Think of it this way. Yeah. Uh, America has roughly 5,000 jails and prisons, and there are geez, tens of thousands of probation sites and mm-hmm. parole sites in the United States. There are 4,000 specialized drug courts, about 1,000 veterans courts, uh, and then other places in the world have something very similar. So we're only in 14,000 places. So we're like 5% of it, uh, but that's a big, yes, it big is. chunk. So yes, I would, um, in retrospect, I would do the same thing. It allowed me many decades ago the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. Right. So that's so, how all this other stuff took place. Right, right. And that's what I'm saying, that sometimes we make choices. Yes. Oh, and... absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, the, a real simple example. I worked for the, doing these, this treatment system. The, the, when I was actively uh, training in correctional departments, or like entire systems, uh, I would go and spend a couple weeks, usually in a training facility, uh, we did this in Oklahoma for two years and trained every employee in the Oklahoma Department of Corrections to do it. Uh, we did it at uh, University, uh, sorry, Oklahoma State University in Stillwater. But we also did it in Washington State. And in Washington okay. State, some of the 
uh, government officials in the Department of Corrections, like the Assistant Commissioner of Corrections, got very interested in my UFO books. Really? Got them and said, oh, my God. And, they, and I, in them, I talked about Toppenish Ridge on the Yakima Indian Reservation, which at that time, it was then illegal for people to go on to the Yakima Reservation and look for UFOs. The tribe had actually passed a law making it illegal for people for ufologists to go out and try to look and photograph UFOs. There was an area there called Toppenish Ridge that in the 70s to the early till the 80s had thousands of UFO reports including thousands of photographs, loads of officials saw it and it's something I wanted to do to go look. And now this okay. was in 1992 when I was out there. So they said, well, we can go. We just took a state car out, <laughs> and we spent night after night out there. Okay. Uh, we were not bothered by anyone. Uh, I wound up taking a lot of photos. The night photos showed nothing, and the day photos showed all these bizarre objects over this thing called Toppenish Ridge, which is a... Uh, it's a it's a rounded kind of mountain that is real long. There's not a single tree on it, and it is covered with hundreds of earthquake fault lines. And those fault lines are what are tied to these UFOs. But uh, the natives that live along the bottom of Toppenish Ridge have talked about these balls of light rolling down the mountain, and when they go outside, they get close to them, they start seeing either like a Sasquatch, a Bigfoot, mm -hmm. or they will see little blue people, aliens or whatever, mm -hmm. and sometimes UFOs when the lights come down to them. Yeah. Now, it's all very, very strange, but right. working for the Department of Corrections in a for UFOs where you're not allowed to go look. And, and you know, it almost sounds like what you're describing, somewhat like what's been described as Skinwalker Ranch before. Uh, yeah, I you know, know a lot of, yeah. Before they, you know, because from what I understand now, you can't even get close to the place because they kind of have everything uh, locked down as far well, as... Well, I recommend a guest for you, Andrew Collins. Okay. Uh, and there is a uh, a new four-part documentary coming out, series coming out on the History Channel, specifically on the Skinwalker Ranch. Okay. Uh, uh, and Andrew has spent quite a bit of time there. He was flown over, um, and he he cannot talk about it mm -hmm. um, until the uh, till it starts showing. I'm not right, sure when it's right. going to show. Okay. Uh, but that is also one of his areas, and I am very interested in it also because the whole idea of a skinwalker goes back to Native American shaman right. uh, and rituals that they would perform. Um, and so on. But I, I really can't talk much about it either. Well, because some uh, of the Andrew, phenomena that they described there, it wasn't just to oh, the yeah. UFOs. It was what the people that lived on the land were experiencing. And obviously, it also had some type of history with the Native Americans from that area. So it, it goes back a while. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And I'm, that's partly why I'm really into the Native American stuff. Just uh, a few months ago, my wife and I spent 10 days on the... Um, Navajo Nation uh, Reservation, uh, doing research on shamanistic practices and some of the sites. We went to some really remote sites there, and we're heading back soon because I'm, I'm working on a follow-up book to that one called Denisovan Origins with Andrew Collins. Uh, but that's um, another project. And so just being able to do all this, I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. And if I hadn't have gone into that field, I suspect I would not have been doing any of this. Let me ask you something, Strange especially stuff. since you have this background in psychology, Greg. What do you think about this trend about people uh, taking ayahuasca and all these mind-altering uh, drugs? And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't think that's safe, but maybe that's just a chicken in me. Yeah, but, well, I, <laughs> you know, uh, I know Graham Hancock. Uh, mm -hmm or ours, uh, called America Before, which is similar to ours. We exchanged uh, manuscripts before, and his came out very quickly. Ours took a year from the time that we finished it. Uh, Graham is an advocate for that. Uh, they, he is one who um, 
and and there are some others that anybody anybody that writes good stuff say about LSD ayahuasca has a substance in it called DMT which is dimethyltryptamine dimethyltryptamine is also synthesized um, pharmaceutically and it was known in the 70s as the businessman special because it is essentially a 30 minute LSD trip Wow, that's what it does it's like a 30 minute LSD trip if you take regular LSD you will be under the influence of it. If you take a standard dose, you'll be under the influence four to six hours, maybe eight hours. Mm-hmm. It depends on your body size and so on. So it's it was called the businessman special because, oh, you could take it over your lunchtime. Uh, you could hallucinate and have all your fun under the LSD influence, and then by the time your lunch breaks over, you're okay. <laughs> so, ayahuasca, uh, they are promoting it for therapeutic value and on and on. Uh-huh. Uh, there is some real research going on uh, with LSD, uh, with psilocybin, uh, with DMT. If I was going to take it, I would prefer the pharmaceutical version rather okay. than smoking it or having it uh, blown up your nose to where you have to snort it. Right. Uh, there are too many people doing it who probably shouldn't be doing it. My mm-hmm. area is crime, substance abuse is intimately related to crime. Yes. Um, most substance abusers are not criminals. Most al- most people that drink are not alcoholics and they don't mm-hmm. commit crime. But it's it does cause problems for some people. Sure. Um, it doesn't make people smarter despite the fact that they will claim that, oh, people get incredible ideas mm-hmm. under it. That is few and far between. More often, it dissolves or disintegrates certain portions of your personality, which may or may not be a good thing. I, in, in the 1970s, I knew many, many people mm-hmm. who used LSD or used DMT or psilocybin or mescaline, for that matter, and had very, very bad experiences that altered their life forever. I so just... I think... That I think it is not a good thing for people to do it willy-nilly. Well, well you uh, always hear these people that, like you said, just about anybody, that it's because you mentioned about shamanistic, you know, like they want to have yeah. like that shamanistic experience and blur yeah. the line between the unseen world kind of thing. Yeah. And well, I'm here's thinking, the, uh... I'm telling these British authors all the time, you, you guys are blowing this out of proportion. The shaman... That was like the last thing that they did. That's mm-hmm. not something that they did all the time. Right. People, people always ask me. I know a lot about the shamanic rituals and what they actually did. And go, oh, my God, they use drugs. It's like they're using drugs every day, but they're not. Right. They use it only a few times a year for very specific rituals under their controlled circumstances. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were very careful with it. Uh, and we just don't do that anymore. Now, I'm not going to tell people what to do or what they shouldn't do. Um, right. The law is the law is what I basically say. If you disagree with the law, do what you can to change it or move somewhere where the law suits, yeah, suits I, what you want to do. Exactly. But, exactly. Uh, no, I'm not an advocate for everybody using those substances. I think it's great that the VA, for example, Veterans Administration, mm-hmm. is using some of these hallucinogenic substances with great effect on some of uh, the soldiers who have come back with PTSD right. or traumatic brain injury, TBI. Okay. Uh, so that is being done with some of them, but only with some of them. Right. Uh, at the same time, they're doing things like pet therapy. They're, they are uh, they take a dog that is having trouble, and they let the dog live with them. And the fact that they are caring for an animal mm-hmm. that actually loves them back is enough to help heal them. Yes. And that is a good thing. I too. imagine Anything that, that, that works. That's, right. That that why why go the pharmaceutical route if you could do something like pet therapy, for example. Exactly. And, I mean things like music therapy. You will see that yoga. Mm-hmm. And I don't do yoga, and I used to scoff at it when I would read that it, yoga was being used in uh, therapeutic settings. And mm-hmm. honestly, I did scoff at it. I don't anymore. Yoga is now uh, an evidence-based practice for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and yes. trauma yes. with veterans. And I think that's good. Yes. And those veterans that do it and get help with it, more power right. to them. Yeah, yeah. And, and I imagine, like, everybody, everybody's different. Certain things work better with certain individuals. 
versus others. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, you need option. We need options. Mm-hmm. Sure. And if push comes to shove, fine. They can try any pharmaceutical interventions that are out there and possible to use that are under some sort of controlled way where we can actually quantify the effect. Right. Right. And Actually doing and, 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 and um, this is a, a little bit of a walk on the paranormal side that, yeah. you know, when you when we talk about, you know, any type of whether it's ayahuasca or any other type of drug, you know, that's used, you know, always that theory, you know, that you're going to you're going to co- come back with something that you didn't intend right. to. And I'm not talking here like organically changes, let's say, your your brain. Right. And we're talking here on the paranormal. That I sometimes think, you know, you know, you might want to be having this this very weird experience, but what if it's something that later on you can't shut down? Well, yeah. absolutely. And there are actually things that organic that do. do uh, that's the whole area of psychopharmacology. That yeah. was my initial area. I actually wrote a textbook in many, yes. many years ago. Well, many in two thousand. Uh, so it was now 19 years ago I wrote that textbook. But it's all about receptor sites and the biochemistry right. of it and the electromagnetic effects of it. That's how it works, through yes. the, work through the neurotransmitters and the receptor sites and through the pathways in the brain. And they do change through the experience. And if you do the, ex- if you do the experience repeatedly or the drug repeatedly, mm-hmm. it makes those changes semi-permanent. I say wow. semi-permanent because everything in the brain is truly semi-permanent. Right. You can change it. Uh, so right. you are changing somewhat the internal structure of the brain with almost any drug that you use. And the same mm-hmm. thing is true with experiences. Sure. Somebody that uses meditation regularly is changing the structure of their brain permanently. And not permanently. I sh- again, I shouldn't right, say that. Right, but they, they, it becomes like, like, like when you learn how to drive a car, it becomes easier. Exactly. And you do it even without really thinking about it. Exactly. It becomes habitual. Yes. And habit, habits are a, uh, an increase in certain pathways between different brain areas that you don't have to think to make it happen. That's how balance works. If you're walking and you're losing your balance somewhere, you walk along a curb, let's say, uh, it's the back part of your brain called the cerebellum that's doing it. You don't even have to consciously right. do it. Exactly. That's why we can walk and talk and chew gum at the same time and look around. Yeah. Because the, it's doing it all unconsciously on its own. I think that is fascinating. Anyway, Greg, I'm going to ask you one last question because okay. I'm curious about this. You said you found a bunch of uh, planes out there. Yeah. Have yeah. you ever found, I've heard of in the Everglades, of planes being found that they can't identify. And by the way, this predates the times where, you know, they were, run, you know, drug runners were, you know, yeah. dropping stuff off. These were yeah. told, but they can never, in other words, they could never identify the planes as, oh, this plane was reported missing. Right. Well, I have heard of that. Uh, we were only out, when we found these 31 planes out mm-hmm. of the 31, I actually hadn't totaled how many that we truly identified. Okay. And I would say out of 31 we probably made a definite idea on no more than five. Okay. Because when planes go underwater, mm-hmm. all of the details about what they are, particularly older planes, the paint is all gone. There's an end number on the back. It's usually on the tail of a plane on both right. sides. Some older planes have it on the fuselage on the side, but that's almost always gone. The interior of the plane, one of the reasons we always tried to get in the inside of a plane is because the end numbers were virtually always gone, uh, okay. except for a few times. So you get into the inside, and there's usually ID plates in there that will give you the date of manufacture, or maybe, maybe the number of the fuselage when it was made. Uh, sometimes there are other identification plates in there off of parts. So that's what we usually are trying to find. But it is incredibly difficult to ever find anything on an old plane that will identify it because they've had parts taken off, right. they've had parts replaced, taken mm-hmm. in and out, and they didn't keep records then. Today, yeah. any modern plane, every part is entered into a computer system. So that if a plane crashes, they can pull a part out of a plane and they know exactly when that part was put in that plane 
when it was done and what that plane is, but it wasn't true until basically the 2000s. Right, yeah, I know that there was... So, yeah, there's a... I'm not surprised of that. There are planes that they found not too far off of Miami mm-hmm. that were similar to uh, Flight 19 planes. They're Torpedo Avenger bombers, mm-hmm. but they have no idea where they came from. Right. Like, which is amazing. Yeah, like nobody ever where reported, the world we lost this plane. Like, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, they either crashed or they were dumped off of a ship that went by. You know, aircraft carriers sometimes would, would push planes off of the deck uh, when a plane had a problem and couldn't be fixed or when they needed to get it off fast because there were planes that needed to land and it was blocking the deck. Right. Uh, so they would do that, but not along coastal Florida. Exactly. They didn't do that. And that's and that's that's what we you know because out in the Everglades that theory yeah, doesn't, I know. <laughs> that doesn't work either. But yeah, I know. That's how, makes... I was curious about that because I was like, you know what? For and I know nowadays, especially with uh, you know satellite and uh, right. the, the, you know they can track anything basically more or right. less. You know, once upon a time that didn't happen. But uh, yeah, I think it's very interesting that a lot of things sometimes, for lack of a better word, went on under the radar. Yeah, um, you're right. A lot of mysteries there. But anyway, Greg, thank you so much. It has been fascinating speaking well, to thank you. Thank you. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, Love it. And uh, do you have any book? Pro- I was going to say, I know you have book projects. <laughs> it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I'm working when's... on this new one with Andrew on shamanistic beliefs and so on. But uh, what I recommend people to do, I'm on Facebook, Gregory mm-hmm. L. Little. got to put my full name, Gregory L. Little. Or look me up on Google, Gregory okay. L. Little, and you'll find me. Okay. You'll find my Twitter page right away, and my and there's a panel there that shows some books that I've done, although they don't have them all, but that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> okay. No, God, yeah. Well, anyway, good luck to you on all your projects. It has been Thank wonderful to speak so to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Will do. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Let me tell you something. You know, I say this a lot about a lot of my guests, but I could th- there's so many things that we could speak to Greg about because... Let's face it, if you've written 69 books, that's just the book part of it. Plus all the, and I want to use the best word, I mean, adventures in the sense of, you know, things that he's done and whether he's been researching or, you know, documenting or whatever. And and it's so funny because you can tell that some of the things he looks back now on and he's like, stupidly, I did this. Like, I think that happens as you get older. When you look back, you go, man, that was, was, I was really lucky. I do that now too, like, uh, okay, what was I thinking of? But anyway, I think that's, um, you know, for anybody, I mean, Edgar Casey was, God, that's been around for a long time. And he was the one that, um, you know, what talked about Atlantis. Um, because a lot of people, you know, they sometimes think that all these things like Atlantis and uh, lost cities or lost civilizations and all this, this is like, like a more mo- when I say modern, I'm talking about the '90s. But Edgar Casey, I mean, th- I mean, there's been a lot of metaphysical belief systems, but as far as, um, I mean, that he was giving exact information, not very, okay, not not Nostradamus kind of interpretations. And I know people are going to be going out there going, "Oh, Marlene Nostradamus." I don't know. I read some of the stuff from Nostradamus, and I'm thinking this could be anything. <laughs> This is just about anything. It's like, depends how you want to interpret it. But anyway, um, with Edgar Casey, it was different. You know, he was, first of all, he was more modern than Nostradamus, but he was pretty exact as far as what he was describing. And one of the things he described was uh, the existence of Atlantis. You know, and of course, the the the, the belief that um, that Atlantis predated all the what we consider ancient civilizations. In other words, it was ancient, ancient. It predates what we know as ancient civilizations. And of course that it got destroyed because of some cataclysmic event. Um, who knows what it could have been? I mean, you know, I've heard theories of, well, well it was um, something that happened, maybe a meteor hit or the other one, which is where they kind of engineered something that they kind of lost control of and what's the, what's the most appropriate word blew up i mean or that it just caused 
uh, the, the destruction of their civilization. I mean, there's a lot of theories about that. And, um, and a lot of people say, well, it, it, I'll tell, I'll give you an example of uh, before when they had the, uh, uh, you know, like the, the, the city of Troy, for example, you know, before at one point, you know, it's been discovered. The city of Troy was discovered, but previous to that, people thought that it was just part of a story of a, the ancient, uh, uh, of an ancient city, but it was it didn't really exist. It was used as part of a story of Ulysses and you know and all these things of the ancient world and the Greeks and and everybody thought it was just a part of a story. And it turns out, for example, that they found Troy. As a matter of fact, they have found a lot of things which um, originally were believed to just be made up uh, or were styled after something, but that that wasn't it. What was being described was not really actually it it's just and then it's been unearthed and uh i think that the same thing uh applies to atlantis especially when we're talking and, and you know and like i live in south florida when he described where that had a growth of coral on it let me tell you something when something and i'm not even talking thousands or hundreds of years and even less Salt water and seawater growth on something can disguise it pretty quick uh, where you don't see it anymore or it's disfigured and you cannot recognize it, for example, as something is man-made or you can't see it unless you see it from a certain, like what we what he was describing, either your overhead. Uh, the only good thing about what he was describing is that these waters, uh, you know, off of Andros and Bimini, the, the water's translucent and it's shallow water. And, and I was surprised when he said those because basically those two formations, for lack of a better word, he debunked it, which was great because, you know, he found this these were naturally occurring phenomena. This was not something that was earth made. But it, to me, I think it's great when the research is done to prove this is not what everybody thought it was. It looked like it which is fantastic. But I think for true researchers, it's just as important to discover when something is naturally occurring versus, can you imagine if, let's say he wouldn't have, they wouldn't have done that research and found, let's say like the sponges and all of this, that people would be out there going, yeah, there's a, there's like a, a Stonehenge by the Bahamas or by this island. And it's not, it's just something that looks like it. But then when you investigate it, it turns out to be, it's not what, People are thinking a structure, uh, which is to me is is really what true research is, and I've talked about it versus sensationalism, uh, which is when you find something that has merit, it's that you think this really truly does have merit. And what I found also extremely interesting was what he was talking about, and and I and I did see something about it where the the age of North and South America, the continents are much older. Um, also that they had done that DNA study or comparison to some of the populations in South America. And it turns out because, you know, everybody, you know, the, 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 the regular explanation was that people the, came in like over a landmass from like Siberia and then they trickled down from North America to South America. And then that that's how the native populations came, of course, thousands of years ago. And it turns out that these people have genetic uh, ties to uh, the Pacific Islanders, which again goes back to a lot of these people. How far were they able to sail? Or was, you know, are we talking a landmass or were they able to sail much further than anybody could explain or thought? Same thing. Uh, a lot of times people, you know, how everybody, Christopher Columbus didn't really discover America or, you know, Jamestown, they, that wasn't the first settlement, you know, where uh, there's more and more evidence being turned up that, you know, that Vikings and other seafaring, I mean, there's even one, I believe, and I, this is just me, like, that, that maybe even Phoenicians actually came out here uh, and ran to this landmass because the Phoenicians were known 
as very good seafarers. Again, you know, and this is the thing, um, you know, because of, and, and up to a certain point, I understand people want to see like, hey, I, I, I want to find the structure that they built or I want to find evidence. You know what? If think about it, if you if you're one of these uh, seafaring, you know, civilizations, which you're really good at it. But let's say you come out here. It could have happened one of two ways. Either you did it purposely or you got blown off course. And all of a sudden you're like, here, hey, we found this. What? And most of these people, sometimes their intentions were not to stay. In other words, they didn't uh, build cities or build structures that could be unearthed. And there's hopefully sometimes we do find things, but not all the time. Sometimes some of the evidence that's found is like difficult to understand or difficult to understand what are the origins of it. Um, but I think it, it lends, which I think is that a lot of what's been written so far in history books uh, about ancient civilizations or discoveries and uh, migrations of people uh, is, I'm not going to say wrong, but not correct all the way. Or in some cases that they kind of say, this is what it all started. And apparently there is civilizations that that's much older, much, much older than what we call ancient civilizations. You know, like, you know, when you, when you hear about, you know, uh, civilization starting out like in the Middle East, like by the Euphrates and uh, what's now like uh, the Middle East, uh, that all these civilizations flowered from there. These This is what's considered the ancient world. Well, it turns out that it was ancient, but that there was possibly maybe things that were older, civilizations that were older. Um, and that's why I even asked him, because he was referring to the mound builders that, you know, you look at the structures that even the Maya and other Mesoamericans built, which was like the pyramids and these temples and all these things. And you think about this is something older than that. Okay. And then you think of the pyramid in Egypt. Uh, and I mean, there's pyramids in uh, places in Asia. And you think, well, was this just coincidental that everybody decided to build the pyramid because it gave you a better view? Over, I, who knows? Or was this some type of, um, how can I say, was this an influence, let's say, of a diaspora from Atlantis where you had survivors uh, that fled, fled the destruction of Atlantis. And some of them just ended up at different points. And they kind of like gave their you know, what they knew, what they remembered. Just think about it. Let's say you're you're one of these people that is actually able to leave a certain place. And you might not be a scientist. You not, might not be an engineer. You just have general information that the population has. And all of a sudden, you are one of these people that actually, for whatever reason, like you said, right place, right time, and you survive you and your family survive and you're thrust into possibly a land is not nearly as civilized or as knowledgeable but let's say you could say i we had these kind of structures but i don't know how to build it it's the like, same thing somebody i mean i could tell somebody hey I, where where i live there's skyscrapers and there's bridges and there's this and there's that, but I don't know how to build one. I can tell you what it looks like. I can tell you what it's used for. And, and, and you know, when people are fleeing, let's say if, if we go with that theory of Atlantis basically imploding and under whatever, whatever reason it was and whether some of them had time to get out or it was, it was, it's, you know how, um, what was it? The, uh, what was that movie that came out like in 2000, Final Impact? I can't remember what the name of it. It was one of those doomsday where that meteor is coming and they pick and choose who they're going to let live in these underground bunkers when this meteor hits. And of course, they're looking for, you had to be a certain younger and you had to have 
And if you were older, it was like you had to be a some some type of specialty, a scientist and an artist. There had to be something about you that got you a spot to survive. But let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say something catastrophic happens and there's no such thing as we're going to pick and choose who's going to survive to tell the story. It's just a general population. Whoever gets out, which to me kind of explains why maybe in a lot of instances they weren't able to duplicate maybe the, the, the engineering or the, the knowledge that they had is like, you know, grab your, mm, and get the, and get out and live and just describe what was there in this place that you lived in once, uh, depending of course, where you ended up at. And of course, something like that gets diluted. Um, Think about, think about even our own history, where once upon a time, uh, you know, th there was a lot of civilizations that never, de never developed a form of writing. Basically, they left their history word of mouth, like they, they would have uh, storytellers or people who, that they would, that would carry on the oral traditions of that culture, but they never developed a form of writing. Uh, so, I mean, it could, it's, it's, people say, well, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't there be some, something more substantial uh, to prove that there was such a civilization if they were that intelligent or if they were that advanced? Again, depends what happened to them and who survived. And even the ones that survived, where they ended up at. Uh, as far as them being able to reproduce the technology that they had, maybe it was beyond their means, knowledge-wise or numbers-wise. Maybe uh, only a very small percentage of the population was actually able to survive whatever the catastrophe was. And again, and I mean, there's a lot of theories that we could go round and round on that, but I think it's fascinating. Uh, and again, I, I love speaking to Greg. So I urge you guys, uh, like you said, you can find him on Facebook. I know his books are on Amazon and obviously he's, he's got a lot, lot. I mean, I only showed the books, some of the latest ones, but he's got plenty to pick from depending on what your interests are. And guys, uh, again, if you have any, uh, any stories, you can send them to me at Marlene at mymigoschronicles.com. Also, MarlenePardo.com or MyMigosChronicles.com. I have links to the shows, to the MP3 files, or to the podcast platforms. Also, you can find my author page on Amazon at Marlene Pardo Pelliser. Um, as you can tell, I've got two uh, fiction books out there, which is uh, classified as supernatural fantasies. And as a matter of fact, I'm working on a third one right now uh, that I'm hoping to put out now in the spring it's had a really 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 good reception um so yeah please uh and, and every once in a while i do put it out for if, if you're interested in reading it uh a kindle version on amazon for free for like maybe four or five days i usually announce that on on my social media page whether it's uh any, any place i can plaster it on so again, guys, thank you so very much for being part of my audience. You are, are wonderful. Take care.